I'm just going to wait a, a few seconds here to let people come into the uh, into the space. Okay, um, good afternoon and welcome to PNP Live. I'm uh, Brad Graham, co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And we have a, a great event for you uh, this afternoon featuring Karen Tumulty and her illuminating new biography, The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first though, uh, to pose a question at any point during the event, just click on the Q&A icon at, at the bottom of the screen. The chat function also at the bottom uh, is for, well, ch chatting, not asking uh, a question, uh, but in that box, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. Uh, uh, Karen's uh, Washington Post columns are, I'm sure, familiar to many of you. In previous incarnations during her long and accomplished journalistic career, uh, Karen also has served as a national political correspondent for The Post. And before that, she reported for Time Magazine and the Los Angeles Times. The Triumph of Nancy Reagan is Karen's first book and it, an ambitious one in, in that the former first lady was a complicated and at times controversial figure. As the only person in the world to whom Ronald Reagan felt truly close Nancy Reagan exercised enormous influence, uh, but as Karen writes, she did so unlike any first lady before or since. And as fiercely as Nancy tended to her husband's image, she could be, again, as Karen notes, clueless about managing her own. Reviews of Karen's book have been, well, very positive, praising it for its depth and nuance and for its revealing, insightful storytelling truly a definitive biography about an exceptional first lady. Conversation with Karen this afternoon will be Susan Page, the award-winning Washington bureau chief of USA Today, where she writes about politics and the White House. Susan's first book, The Matriarch, about Barbara Bush, was a bestseller a few years ago. And her new book, Madam Speaker, about the life of Nancy Pelosi, comes out later this week. and, and um, and, and, she, and she'll be uh, talking about it tomorrow in an online event also sponsored by PNP at 6 p.m. So be, be sure to, to tune in then as well. Uh, so Karen and, and Susan, the screen is yours. Brad, thank you so much. Such a, such a privilege to do this event with my friend Karen Tumulty and also a privilege to do uh, an event sponsored by Politics and Prose, a wonderful bookstore. What would Washington do without this bookstore and the events that it sponsors for authors and, and readers. So thank you very much. Karen's book has gotten phenomenal reviews. Everyone has talked, used words like illuminating and engrossing uh, and revelatory in talking about it, just came out on last Tuesday. She writes about uh, what Bradley, Brad described as so, a first lady who was sometimes controversial. Actually, Nancy Reagan was almost invariably controversial and what Karen has found in this biography is how consequential she was as well, sometimes in ways that we didn't understand at the time. Karen and I are gonna be glad to take some questions from those of you who are watching this, please just uh, submit them and we'll get to them later in this hour. Well, Karen, first I wanna say what a great book, what a wonderful cover. And I wonder if you would talk the photo on the cover. It's not one of those familiar pictures of Nancy Reagan from her time in the White House. It shows a younger Nancy Reagan. Can you tell us what this photo is from and why did you choose it to put it on the cover of your book? Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for doing this, Susan. And thank you everyone who has joined us on what here in Washington is a spectacular uh, pre-cicada day. Um, but yeah, I the first time I ever saw that photo of Nancy Reagan was when Simon and Schuster, my publisher, showed it to me as the as the cover, and I just thought it was so perfect for the book. I mean, she she doesn't look like I, I thought I'd seen every photo there was of her. I mean, this isn't the fashionista Nancy. She's not wearing red. The red is in the background, and I think what I hope it does is signal to the reader that this is a serious book of 
and that looks at you know the real sort of consequential impact of this first lady in one of the most consequential presidencies of the 20th century. You know, I, I actually covered the Reagan White House working for Newsday. I thought I knew a lot about Nancy Reagan, but there was so many, there were so many surprises in your book of things that I didn't know about her uh, from her early life, uh, also during her time at the White House. And I wonder for you, as someone who had been a reporter in Washington for years, what was the biggest surprise that you found in your research? Well, I, I came to Washington in the 1980s for the Los Angeles Times, but I covered the Hill. So basically what I knew of Nancy Reagan were the two sort of caricatures, either the vapid socialite who didn't care about anything but fashion and decorating or you know the scheming power behind the throne. And it was really the complexity of her that surprised me as I got, I, I worked on this book for four and a half years. It was really two years into the research that the pieces started to fit together. Um, first of all, I thought I was going to be writing about a woman, a marriage, a relationship. Um, I discovered that these are two people whose bond to each other really does go back to the troubles and insecurities of their childhoods. But the more I got into it, the more I realized that this was also a new way of looking at Ronald Reagan's rise, his presidency, and really a moment in our history that, that was a hinge point. You uh, interviewed scores of people for this interview. How, how many people did you interview, would you estimate? Uh, dozens and dozens and dozens. Um, and, you know, some of them were people, uh, George Schultz, the former Secretary of State, recently passed away, was 97 years old when I interviewed him. And he told me a story, he was one of my first interviews. He told me a story that I didn't under, I, I was too early in the research to understand the significance at the time, but it ended up being the opening of the book. And that is shortly after he becomes Secretary of State, this is seven months into the job, early 1983, he really doesn't know the Reagans all that well. And Nancy in the middle of a blizzard uh, invites him over to the White House for a private dinner. It would just be him and his wife, two couples. And it is, it, Schultz is just back from an overseas trip had included a stop in China. And he suddenly is surprised that both of the Reagans are just pounding him with questions about the Chinese. And then Ronald Reagan moves on to the Soviet Union and talks about his own ideas for engaging the Soviet Union, his own confidence in his abilities as a negotiator. And this is the moment that George Shultz in an environment away from the president's hardline hawkish advisors, he begins to realize as, as he put it with me, this man has never had a conversation with a big time communist leader and he is dying to have one. But in that same moment, he realizes that this is the whole purpose of this little private dinner that Nancy Reagan has set up. And he also begins to realize that this first lady is going to be an incredibly important ally to him. And that is one thing you find in the Reagan administration. The people, as I say in the book, you know, she rarely set foot in the West Wing, but if she was not happy about something, they all knew it. And if, if, if somebody was not in her favor, they tended not to last very long in their jobs. But people like George Schultz, People like James Baker, the chief of staff, were smart enough to figure out she could be an important ally. And as James Baker told me, her political instincts, her nose for trouble was actually better than Ronald Reagan's. You know, one of the biggest, perhaps the one, certainly one of the biggest achievements of the Reagan administration was his willingness to engage the Soviet Union, his willingness to negotiate with Mikhail Gorbachev, which to the surprise of any number of people who thought they knew Ronald Reagan well, would he have 
Would he have done that without her voice in his ear about that? What role did she play in uh, getting she, to do that historic thing? She certainly pushed, but um, yes, what it was really her understanding of her husband. Um, number one, she didn't want him to go down in history as a warmonger. She believed that he was a consequential president. She actually hoped he would win the Nobel Peace Prize. She also understood, as most of Reagan's own advisors didn't understand, that along with his hardline anti-communist rhetoric, there really was an idealist, uh, somebody who believed in the biblical prophecy of Armageddon, who believed in the possibility of a world without nuclear weapons, and that it was possible for these two instincts to coexist in this man. But, you know, the Reagans were a real married couple, and they would argue over things, including she was constantly on him to tone down his hardline rhetoric. Um, and I have another scene in the book. They, they would argue in front of other people where Stu Spencer, who is his uh, closest, earliest political strategist, comes over to another private dinner at the White House very shortly after Ronald Reagan has used the phrase evil empire to describe the Soviet Union. And his wife is just pounding on him about this and what a mistake it was. So Reagan over dinner turns to Spencer, hoping he's gonna get a reprieve from this guy and from his wife. And he says, but what about you, Stu? What do you think? And Spencer goes, well, you know, I agree they're an evil empire, but that was a little, you know, harsh. And at that point, Reagan realizes Spencer's giving his wife more ammunition. And he just says, what's for dessert? <laughs> So you interviewed dozens and dozens of people, uh, including you know, Jim Baker is quoted in the book, uh, uh, Secretary of State Schultz, so glad that you had a chance to talk to him before he, before he passed away. Thinking about giving you real insights into understanding Nancy Reagan, who would you, what interview do you think was really the most helpful in doing that? Uh, oh gosh, there were just so many, but um, their son, Ron, who who talked about his parents and said, you know, my father was as good a man as you would ever meet, but he was very trusting. He believed that the people around him, and, and we know that about Reagan, that he was famous for being a delegator. Um, and he said, you know, my mother was really the one who understood that not everybody who talks a good game can deliver, that not everybody around the president is pursuing the president's agendas and not their own. Uh, she said, when somebody needed to go, my mother was the one who knew it first and often was the one to make that happen. The other thing he talked about was his father, for as affable and genial as Ronald Reagan was, for all of his gifts at connecting with the country, was really a solitary figure. Um, given his druthers, he'd have just been out at the ranch by himself, pounding fence posts. And it was really Nancy Reagan who forced him to get out, who really built the political network around him, cultivated the, the rich benefactors. And um, th at one point, Ron Reagan referred to it as, as forcing his father out on play dates. <laughs> you know, uh, we didn't pre-cook that question, but as a reader, I thought the Ron Reagan quotes were the most uh, insightful into things that uh, maybe no one else could really understand. And one of the things that you quote Ron Reagan in talking about is, uh, his mother's fear of abandonment. And, you know, you wonder why she had this kind of brittle shell uh, often. Uh, and some of it had to relate to this very painful childhood. Tell us about that. So Nancy, the future Nancy Reagan is born in 1921. Her name was Anne Frances Robbins. She would, for many decades, claim it was 1923, but it was 1921. And she was the product of a very bad match between an ambitious actress 
and a not very successful car salesman. The, the marriage is effectively over by the time Nancy is born. Uh, as soon as she is out of diapers, her actress mother essentially abandons her to relatives in Bethesda, Maryland. And so for the next six years of her life, this child is just, is just yearning for this absent mother. And she actually gives, she, you know, she would sort of gloss over the lingering effects of this childhood. I, I found a few places where she talked about it openly. But Ron told me that really did leave her with a permanent fear of abandonment, a permanent insecurity. You know, no matter how charmed her life might seem, she was always convinced she was standing on a trap door. And certainly that seems to be confirmed two months into Ronald Reagan's presidency when he almost dies because of would-be assassin's bullet. And he, Ronald Reagan came much, much closer to death than the White House then acknowledged or wanted the country to know. But certainly she then spends the rest of his presidency just convinced that every time he leaves the White House, um, he, there's treachery waiting. Now, Ronald Reagan, because he's a religious man, believes God spared him, God has a plan for him. She doesn't have that kind of faith to fall back on, which is why she does things that are, you know, as nutty as turning to an astrologer to control the schedule of the president of the United States. And then finally, at the end of his, they leave office, Ronald Reagan seeming hale and hearty. And very shortly after that, he is incapacitated by Alzheimer's disease. As Nancy Reagan would say, I thought our golden years would be sharing memories. Um, so it falls on her for the last 10 years of her husband's life and then the next 12 years of her own in his life to become the keeper and guardian of his physical well-being, of his dignity, but also the guardian and shaper of his legacy. She, uh, she certainly tries to put up a counter narrative to the, the liberal, the liberal, you know, he was just an actor reading lines, the famous amiable dunce uh, line of Clark Clifford. But she is also suspicious of people on the right who want to put her husband on a pedestal as kind of this figure to the statue to worship. I mean, she really is determined that his legacy be true to him, which is why she engineers the release of his handwritten diaries of 50 years of his handwritten correspondence, the handwritten speeches that he gave before he was president so that you could really see that this was Ronald Reagan's governing philosophy, that he did come to office with a fully formed uh, vision of what kind of president he wanted to be. Yes, it's such a gift uh, for historians to be able to see those documents. You know, let me just read a question from Elliot, who's among the people who are watching us because it goes to her childhood and her influence on him. And Elliot writes, Nancy Reagan was a child of privilege, daughter of a prominent neurosurgeon, while Ronald Reagan came from more humble and democratic roots. Was it she who steered him toward the Republican party and policies that favored the wealthy class, and maybe that that assumes that she came from a Republican family, at least her kind of her second family when she was adopted uh, by her uh, mother's second husband. But what would you say to Elliot? You know, it's really interesting. I, I always thought that, and as I wrote, you know, if, if Ronald Reagan was the Teflon president, she was the Velcro first lady. <laughs> and if you talk to their old friends in Hollywood, yes, that is the narrative. He used to be a New Deal liberal, she turned him into a right winger. But then if you talk to people from the White House years, they will say, oh, he was a true conservative, but that liberal wife of his, um, it, you know, it was always sort of people would channel their, um, their disappointments in Ronald Reagan through his wife, rather than he was too popular to attack. 
But if I can, so here, her mother, Edith Davis, in 1929, comes to Nancy in Bethesda and announces she's getting married. She has met this pioneering neurosurgeon uh, on a vacation in Europe and that they're moving to Chicago and that they will all be together. And certainly, you know, Loyal Davis was a, a neurosurgeon in the 1920s. But in those days, um, medicine was a prestigious field. It was no way to get rich. Uh, it, you know, he would charge, I think, $500 for a brain surgery or, but he would negotiate his fees according to how many children somebody has, whether they were in or out of work. Certainly she was, um, she was insulated from the effects of the Great Depression, which hit Chicago very hard. But the only time I have ever found that her adoptive father influenced Ronald Reagan on a matter of policy was when he is the brand new governor of California and the legislature presents him, this is before Roe v. Wade, presents him with what would become the most liberal abortion law in the country. And his father-in-law is one of the people who goes to him and argues that he should sign this legislation making abortion available in California. Reagan would later talk about that bill as one of his greatest regrets. He, think, he argued that had he been more experienced as a governor, he would not have signed it. But that is truly the only instance where I have at least found in my research, where Luke Cannon found in his research, where Ronald Reagan turned to his father-in-law and asked his opinion on something like that. Loyal Davis was conservative, but not really in the electoral politics sense. And, and her mother was a big Democrat. And there are photos of the Davises at the 1944 Democratic Convention, sitting in the box with the wife of the mayor of Chicago as FDR is making the fateful decision to ditch his vice president, Henry Wallace, and tap Harry Truman to be vice president. You know, um, you write about some things that are uh, personal, controversial, difficult, not known before. And I'm going to ask you about one of them in just a minute. But first, I, what was the hardest thing to, to find out? What was the hardest thing to report out so that you knew with confidence uh, that you could write about it? Uh, the hardest thing uh, was, I think, the most painful thing in Nancy Reagan's own life, which is the deep, deep dysfunction within the Reagan family. Uh, this is a couple that is bound so closely together. There is really not room in their world for anyone else, including their four children. The two that he had from his first marriage to Jane Wyman, the two that they had together. And each of these children suffers for it in a different way. Nancy Reagan in her own memoir writes, all I ever wanted to be was a good wife and mother and I guess I succeeded at one more than I succeeded at the other. Um, the dedication to her book is to Ronnie who always understood and to my children who I hope will understand. And so uh, Ron talked to me, her, her brother who is in his nineties uh, talked to me for a long time about this. Um, Dennis Ravel, who is the widower of Maureen Reagan talked to me. I was sorry that neither Patty nor Michael uh, would speak with me, but both of them had written their own incredibly raw memoirs about this family. And again, that was, you know, the hardest thing to really feel that I got my arms around and that I really, because every family is so complicated, this family was even more so. 
you know, uh, of course, reporters don't have subpoena power. We can't make people talk to us. We're grateful when people are willing to. But why do you think Ron would talk to you, but Patty and Michael would not? Um, you know, Michael's relationship with her was especially difficult. Um, one thing that I think people might find shocking, I certainly did. When Michael got married for the first time, uh, Ronald and Nancy Reagan, he got married in Hawaii. They chose to be many thousands of miles away that day at Trisha Nixon's wedding in Washington. Um, so there's a lot of pain. He didn't go to, he didn't go to Nancy's funeral. Um, Patty, I, I do not know why she didn't want to talk to me. I respected that decision. And again, with her and Michael, uh, though they didn't talk to me, I really do think that from what they themselves have written, I was able to give them voice in my book. You know, one of the things that uh, I thought must have been very hard to report out, um, and that was something I don't think we knew, which was Nancy Reagan's addiction to prescription drugs, to prescription medicine, even well predating her Just Say No drug campaign in the White House, and, and continuing after that campaign was over. How did that get started and how big a problem was it in her life? Um, well, Patty in her own book writes about her mother in the 1950s uh, becoming addicted to diet pills, to sleeping pills, to tranquilizers. Ron told me that is not precisely his memory of his childhood, although he does have some pretty horrific memories of his childhood. But she does have this very anxious personality. Ronald Reagan has begun after, you know, when they meet, it is just impossible to imagine the future that was ahead for them. They were basically two actors who were at the end of careers that hadn't really taken them very far. He's once again earning money, but he is doing it as the host of General Electric Theater, which means he is constantly on the road, um, leaving his wife at home with these children. She's overwhelmed. She's anxious. And there's a whole generation of women, homemakers from the 1950s, that if they had problems like these and went to a doctor, the male-dominated medical profession didn't want to hear their problems. They would just hand them some tranquilizers and tell them to be on their way. They, they became known as the Milltown generation because of one of the um, medications that was so often prescribed for them. And in those days, people didn't see prescription drugs. We now know differently, of course, with the opioid epidemic, but people didn't see prescription drugs as drugs. They, they saw them as medicine. So um, how I came across this uh, in, and again, after the assassination attempt, she is really anxious, uh, can't sleep at night. One of the incredible acts of generosity in my reporting was that Edmund Morris, a biography who was a bi biographer, Pulitzer Prize winner, who was granted incredible access to Ronald Reagan, who writes a book that is sort of a literary disaster, but he gave me access to his files, including a lot of stuff that didn't make his book. And in those files, um, I discovered that Nancy Reagan's addiction to prescription drugs was so severe during the White House years that the, the physician, the White House physician, a guy named Daniel Ruge, actually goes to Ronald Reagan and tells him, your wife's got a problem here. And I found out from other reporting, I, I cannot tell you my source, but it is solid that this is also a concern subsequently to another White House physician, John Hutton, who actually tries to get her off some of the medications. She has this absolutely violent reaction to withdrawal because she's been on them for so long. Um, and so, yes, I mean, it, the, the great irony here is that her cause is, is drugs, is promoting this just say no to school children at a time when she herself is dependent. We're gonna to go to questions in a few minutes. So if you have a question, please do post it. We'd love to hear 
uh, what you're wondering about, what you're thinking about, if you have a comment or your own perspective. Oftentimes we find in book talks like this, it will amazing people will, will write in with their own experiences, tell us what we'd love to hear about that. You know, one of the things that I think the Reagan administration is most criticized for is the inaction and inattention to the burgeoning health, public health crisis that was HIV AIDS during the Reagan administration. Did, did, did you get gain insight into why they, the administration generally delayed for, for years before taking this on and what role Nancy Reagan may have played in the administration's efforts to, to deal with this important issue? Well, first of all, let me stipulate, and I don't want to soften this, uh, their, their inaction to the AIDS epidemic is one of the deepest and most enduring scars on the legacy of Ronald Reagan and his administration. But in going through the White House files, I, and, and especially some of the speech writing files, I got a picture of what that conversation was like inside the White House. Now, mind you, Ronald Reagan doesn't even use the word AIDS until his second term. I also extensively interviewed Tony Fauci, who was at NIAID back then. But Nancy Reagan does, in part because of her son, Ron, who is dancing with the Joffrey Ballet, who's part of the arts world in New York, and she herself is the daughter of a physician, becomes attuned earlier to it than her husband does. And she and Ron have this sort of private effort to sort of, as Ron started, told me, to sort of getting this into my father's head. But he said, my mother was able to think a little bit more abstractly than my father did, uh, really, nothing even begins to jolt Ronald Reagan out of his complacency until the death of Rock Hudson. Uh, he has a, now has a face, he can, he can put on this. When he finally is going to give his first big address on AIDS, it's 1987, really, really late in the epidemic, tens of thousands of people have died. Um, Nancy Reagan is not willing to trust this speech to the West Wing. Uh, and so she goes out, recruits her own speechwriter, Landon Parvin, who still has all of his notes. He realizes that the president of the United States has never had a conversation with his own surgeon general about AIDS. So Nancy helps set that up, but the you know, at that point among the social conservatives in the administration, um, they believe AIDS is not a health crisis. They think it's a moral crisis. Uh, Pat Buchanan, at one point, the White House communications di director had written before he got to the White House that, you know, that gays had declared war on nature and now nature was getting its revenge. So there is this gigantic battle within the White House over what the president would say in this speech. And in some of the drafts that I was able to get my hands on of the speech going back and forth in Landon Parvin's notes and in other people I talked to, um, that speech could have been way worse. I mean, they were fighting not only the disease itself, but the bigotry and the stigmatization that went along with it. And some of the president's advisors, you know, were trying to, one of the things Everett Koop wanted him to do was tamp down the stigma and, you know, tell people you can't get AIDS from swimming pools and mosquitoes or from having someone who's HIV positive prepare your food. And there are these gigantic battles within the White House, even over something, you know, as small and as obvious as that. Would Ronald Reagan have been- oh, Wait, one more thing, if I can just add those. Of course, The other please. thing is, belatedly, Ronald Reagan um, appoints a big commission to look at the AIDS epidemic. And it is on, it is Nancy Reagan's demand 
that there be an openly gay person on this commission of experts. Again, it, it causes a huge outcry from the right. Uh, Gordon Humphrey, Senator from New Hampshire goes, you know, people's bedroom habits shouldn't be a qualification. Uh, but it, it, again, looking back from 2021, it is uh, shocking to see what the conversation around AIDS was like publicly. Um, here's uh, uh, one of our uh, re listeners, watchers, who says, ask, what did President Reagan know of other people's opinions of Nancy Reagan and how did it affect him? Did he have a real sense of how she was being really vilified uh, at some points during his presidency? Uh, he, he idealized her, Go, going back even, uh, even in the governor's office where she would essentially just drive everybody crazy, you know, if, if the ashtrays hadn't been cleaned up. But, and when people would go to him and try and, you know, say, you know, complain about something she had done, he would say, oh, why Nancy would never do that. So yes, he was aware of the criticism, of the criticism that accompanied the fact that she decides to redecorate the White House and buy thousand dollar a plate and uh, with donated money by thousand dollar a plate china for the white house that she is out there borrowing designer clothes and not returning to them all in the middle of the worst recession since the great depression and yet he would always 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 come to his wife's defense would uh, ronald reagan have become president if he had not married nancy uh, that question came up over and over and over again, and I was amazed at how unanimous the opinion was among people like James Baker, Stuart Spencer, and it was no. Um, she, Stuart Spencer said he never would have become governor without her either. And she would do things like, James Baker becomes the first White House chief of staff he doesn't even know the Reagans all that well at that point. He was a close ally, close friend of George Herbert Walker Bush and had actually been chairman of Gerald Ford's campaign in a big 1976 primary where the, you know, he and Reagan were, were going at each other's throats. So James Baker points out, you know, the Reagans didn't know me well and it was primarily as an adversary. And yet they sort of, Ed Meese, his chief, who had been his chief of staff, ideological, disorganized, he'd been his chief of staff in California. Everyone assumed that he was going to be White House chief of staff. And James Baker told me that it was really Nancy who was the force behind reaching outside their circle and bringing in this, this pragmatist uh, as an you know, there's this somebody who's very sophisticated about the ways of Washington as chief of staff. And we know from our the recent biography by our friend Susan Glasser and Peter Baker of, of Jim Baker, about Jim Baker, no relation to Peter Baker, how crucial that personnel decision was in the success of the, uh, the Reagan presidency, especially in its early days. So here's a question I'm, I love from RJ Agostinelli, who asks, there's been a lot of reporting about the relationship between Nancy Reagan and Barbara Bush. What? Do, <laughs> oh, gee, Susan, we've had this conversation so many times. Yes. The uh, two of them despised each other. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yes. <laughs> I, 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 just to the end of the question, what did you uncover during your research for this book about their relationship? Um, the two of them despised each other. Uh, Barbara Bush could dish it out as well as take it. Um, and I would ask over and over and over again to, to Baker, George Will, all kinds of people who had sort of a close up view of this. And why they despised each other, I think comes from a number of sources. Number one, this brutal, bitter primary fight in 1980, uh, as George Will told me, he said he thought the spouses had more trouble letting go of that than the husbands did. 
And Barbara Bush sort of never let Nancy forget who she thought should be sitting in the Oval <laughs> Office versus going to other people's funerals. But I also think that um, there was a lot about Barbara Bush that stirred Nancy Reagan's insecurities. Number one, Barbara Bush comes from old line, old money. Um, she, Nancy Reagan comes from the parvenu culture of Hollywood. Barbara Bush, though she had her own closet full of designer clothes, although she would point out her husband paid for them, um, is bathed in glowing coverage. She's America's grandmother, where Nancy is, you know, getting savaged in the media. But I also think that um, there was something in the Bush family. You know, the, the Bushes are surrounded by, it, it, it was a functional family. They're surrounded by children, grandchildren who are always around and adore each, each other and adore them. And I think that also goes to a lot of what stirred her insecurities. But as I said, Barbara Bush could dish it out as well. And there is an episode aboard Air Force Two as Bush is getting ready to run for president himself where Barbara Bush goes to the back of the plane where the reporters sit and does this brutal imitation of Nancy Reagan for the reporters. And Lou Cannon, White House correspondent for the Washington Post says to her, you know, Mrs. Bush, the first lady has all kinds of spies. This is gonna get back to her, to which Barbara Bush turns to him and says, I know. Yes, I think there's definitely a Netflix series on the relationship between uh, Nancy Reagan and Barbara Bush, two pretty formidable women. What kind of reaction have you gotten? Your book is, came out, uh, just published just on Tuesday, but I'm, thousands, scores of thousands of them have been sold and, and read, I know. But what kind of reaction have you been getting uh, from your book in these early days? You know, and, and who knows where the critics are going to go from here, but I have been just gratified by the sort of, it's, are you allowed to say a claim about your own book? But <laughs> sort of the, the universal positive reviews, it's, it's gotten starred reviews in Publishers Weekly and Kirkus and Booklist, um, a number of places, including USA Today and Oprah, uh, Newsweek have put it on their lists of the best books to read this spring. Um, and what I really hope people will do, and the early reviews suggest that they are doing that, is really look at this book in its entirety. And it is a book about a flawed and very consequential woman who was very much overdue, I think, for a reassessment and who really did play a very significant role both in uh, the rise of Ronald Reagan and the shaping of his, pre his presidency. And I think in many ways, the heart of the book is the Iran-Contra chapter where she recognizes the danger he is in and she almost single-handedly runs the rescue effort in the White House, which includes a shakeup in the White House staff, starting with White House Chief of Staff Don Regan, who Ronald Reagan does not want to fire, and they have just huge arguments over it. But just as importantly, maybe even more importantly, getting her husband to the place where he is ready to admit to the country and admit to himself that he has traded arms to America's enemy, Iran, as essentially ransom payments for US citizens being held hostage in the Middle East. We have a, here's another question from a, someone who's watching us today. Here's the question. Would Nancy Reagan call herself a feminist? Absolutely not. And um, I, I came across so many letters that she had written over the years, you know, especially in the, she is coming into public consciousness in the 
Looks like we've lost Karen there. Um, so hopefully uh, she will realize that she has uh, has run into a glitch and will um, you know um, maybe we sign off and reconnect. Yeah. Uh, but let me, there are a couple of questions I was just going to read that don't require a response from Karen. So maybe I could read those while we're hoping Karen dials back in. Because uh, I thought, I think they're interesting. One's from Glenna Matthews, who says, I'm just delighted that Ms. Tumulty has written a serious book about a caricatured figure. I'm an historian of women, and I long had the idea of writing such a book, but I knew I couldn't gain all the access that a post reporter could. Brava. Um, and, you know, I think that's true that we are seeing, this is a whole new genre of biographies of women who were either minimized or mischaracterized and who historians and journalists are going back and looking at and re-examining consequential lives that never got, never got the credit that they deserved. I wonder, Bradley, if you found that in, at Politics and Prose. Sure, we're, we're, we're seeing that, and of course, um... Not to preempt your talk tomorrow, but now you've tackled a very prominent political figure in real time, you know, and that's <laughs> a, 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 another trick. Um, but um, and then we we're seeing a spate of of, of uh, very uh, interesting uh, autobiographies by prominent politicians, you know, including two in the in the Senate just just this month, and uh, uh, Tammy Duckworth and and Maisie. Uh, Maisie Hirono. Uh, so there's definitely something going on there. Anyway, Karen, welcome back, and I'll let you two uh, continue. Karen, are you there? I'm sorry about this. I, I do have gremlins in my uh, Wi-Fi. <laughs> oh. Yes, we so all do. It's been, it's been a I lesson for all of us. I was okay. saying before I was <laughs> silenced. Um, a lot of the most critical reporting about Nancy Reagan really came from younger female writers, because I think to them, she really represented like everything that they in the 1970s and 80s had been rebelling against. Here's another question. What would she think of the Republican Party today? Uh, well, she was, um, even in the 90s, was, was very suspicious of a lot of the things that Republicans wanted to do in her husband's name. For instance, uh, in the middle of the Gingrich Revolution, there was a move in Congress to kick FDR off the dime and put Ronald Reagan's profile on it. She, she objected to that, first of all, she said, my husband was a great admirer of, of FDR. Um, she was very, uh, according to her daughter, Patty, when she was invited to speak at the 96 Republican convention, she was reluctant in part because she had been so kind of horrified at the harsh tone of the 92 convention. Um, she hated the annual gathering called CPAC that her husband would always speak at. And, um, you know, ultimately when he is incapacitated with Alzheimer's, she speaks out and uh, comes out in the middle of the Bush administration in favor of stem cell research. Again, a position that is very controversial with the right because uh, the most promising research involved the destruction of, of human embryos, um, so, you know, I, I think that number one, she was very suspicious of people who would take her husband's image and use it for their own purposes. And number two, later in life, you begin to see some of the places where her own views uh, actually did diverge with her husband's. So I know in doing your research, you had the difficult duty of watching a lot of old movies. Was Nancy Davis, in fact, a good actress? I thought she was a perfectly fine actress, but she is a tiny, my favorite single bit of trivia in this book is her screen test is engineered by Spencer Tracy, who is a family friend of the Davis family. And also the Davis family has secretly been helping him through his bouts with alcoholism. 
um, setting up private floors at a hospital in Chicago where he can recuperate. So when Nancy Davis gets an actress of modest accomplishments, gets a shot at a screen test, Spencer Tracy makes sure it goes well. But this is the era, the end of the studio system. This is MGM, the biggest star making factory in history. While Nancy Davis is attractive, I mean, she's on a, the MGM lot with people like Elizabeth Taylor, Ava Gardner. Um, and so the studio tries to sort of counter program her as kind of the, you know, sort of low key, brainy actress in message movies. I thought she was actually quite good. But again, these were not going to be big hits in the era of Annie Get Your Gun. Um, and my little, oh, my little bit of trivia is that because MGM signed her in 1949, that is one of the reasons they take a pass on an up and coming actress who went by the name of Marilyn Monroe, <laughs> which may be the single worst business decision ever made in the history of MGM. Definitely, definitely. One I'm sure they came to regret. You know, Nancy, Nancy Reagan had a difficult relationship with, with reporters. Um, Lou Cannon maybe being an exception, one of the reporters she, she liked, but uh, I think with most reporters, she thought they weren't fair to her. But she once did something very kind to me, which was I was covering the White House for Newsday um, and I was interviewing her and I told her that I had just gotten married and that I, in fact, basically started dating my husband when we were assigned seats next to each other in the press section at Reagan's 1984 inauguration. And she was very taken with story. And then we then got invited to a state dinner, which I think was just like a, a wedding gift, which was quite nice and at odds with her reputation for being uh, difficult uh, and, and happy with reporters. That is exact, it sounds like exactly the kind of story she would have loved. Another sh thing she would do was at state dinners, George Schultz told me, um, Nancy Reagan would always make sure that he was seated next to the most gorgeous actress in attendance. And I, the 97 year old George Schultz still was just delighted as he was telling me, I even got to dance with Ginger Rogers. <laughs> You know, um, I, I hope you'll tell us a little bit about how you came to write this book. Nancy Reagan died of congestive heart failure in 2016. I think that's about the time you started working on the book. Tell us about how, how that came about. Well, this book was not my idea. Um, it was the brainchild of my editor at Simon & Schuster, my old friend, the woman who runs nonfiction at Simon & Schuster, Priscilla Payton, and yes, it was a few months after the death of Nancy Reagan. Priscilla and I, over the years, had talked about many, many book ideas. And um, it's the fall of 2016. I, I just thought, if this woman just sounds pretty complicated and she could be interesting. And, you know, if, if I'm ever going to write a book, a prospect that, quite frankly, terrified me. <laughs> maybe this is the time to take the plunge. And so, you know, I did sort of find my way. It took me four and a half years. Uh, Priscilla, a magnificent editor uh, guiding me the whole way. So for our last question, this will be the last question, but it's going to be the first question that one of our listeners posted on the site. I've been saving it for this moment. It's from Ryan Lee. And Ryan asks, what would you say is the most impactful lesson that we, your readers, can learn from the life of Nancy Reagan? What do you want us to take away after reading your book? Ryan, thanks for that question. Karen, what would you say? You know, I think our first ladies are, again and again, we're finding out how important they are in history. And really, they they each have to like shape this, this role, it doesn't come with a job description, it doesn't come with a portfolio. They really do, the successful ones have to shape it to the needs and of the husband and hopefully someday the wife in office. And when the word powerful is used about a first lady, it's usually not intended as a compliment. But um, I, I do think that the, the role that, that these women have played 
so often in our history uh, shouldn't be lost to history. Well, Karen, thank we're so glad you wrote this book. It's so it's a wonderful book, The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. It's been a pleasure. It was a pleasure to read it and a pleasure to talk to you about it. And I'll turn things back to Bradley Graham now. Yeah, great moderating, Susan. And Karen, yeah. congratulations on a, on a consequential book about a very consequential first lady. I, I, I too am so glad you worked through your initial terror <laughs> about doing a book and labored four and a half years to uh, get it done. Uh, to everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. Uh, reminder again that uh, in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read.